Open worlds often feel like an inevitability. Many studios that design their games in a linear fashion have, as technology has gotten better, experimented with filling their games out with much larger levels. Games that once progressed with a guided nature at the forefront are finding ways to still tightly tell a story while letting the player breathe at their own pace. This had first been explored by Naughty Dog as early as 2003 in Jack 2, and a year later in Jack 3. But as they began exploring how far storytelling can be taken with Uncharted Drake's Fortune, they tightened up their level design. It stayed that way until 2016 when some experimentation began in Uncharted 4's open Madagascar region. It was an idea fully fleshed out a year later in Lost Legacy's Western Gats. It allowed the player for just one level to take the order in which they do some optional tasks into their own hands. Linear narrative driven games come with an expectation that the story being told will not stray too far off course with side objectives at the risk of negatively affecting pace. The story as it is acted out will follow the plot in a mostly straight line. Opportunities to create even more depth in the world can come in the form of collectibles, lost notes, trinkets, and environmental cues. You'll find that one of the common misconceptions about narratives in video games is that everything important happens in cutscenes. If you were to watch only cutscenes of most of today's movie-esque games, you would lack most of the pieces necessary to fairly assess what's been made. It had become apparent when many of The Last of Us Part II's most defining moments were leaked that too many people were still not aware of where most of the important parts of telling stories in video games happen, in between the cutscenes. And thus the irreversible mischaracterization of a game's narrative began. How well what happens in a cutscene lands can heavily depend on the natural conversations and gameplay moments that take place on your way from point A to point B. It's never just gameplay, it's needed context. It's a means of connection that can greatly impact your experience. You're only appreciating it subconsciously because such a good job has been done immersing you past it. The Last of Us Part II does this very effectively in the freedom of approach they give in many areas of Seattle. Part II is a very different game tonally than Part One. It asks a lot of you over the course of 20 plus hours. As a result of a game being filled with so much despair, there needs to be well-placed moments of levity or breaks. Some of these are placed as flashback sequences where you get 30 minutes to revisit the nature of the first game usually after a sequence of heavy combat-oriented sections. It's again those conversations and the location they take place in during gameplay where you can be offered a sense of peace momentarily. Part 2 opens calmly. You're catching up with the change of lifestyle Joel and Ellie have been adapted to for five years already. They really spend an hour and a half or so acclimating you back to the world. The conflict of the ending of the last game looms over everything. But after that hour and a half, the game's dark tone sets in when the plot kicks off with Joel's brutal death. Seven years passed from our first introduction to Joel. When you have seven years to sit with that story, seeing what happens and in the way that it does can be hard to watch. Depending on character attachment, the feeling you get when Joel dies is one that makes you consider taking a break before continuing. On the first playthrough, a death of that magnitude doesn't settle in quickly. It lingers. And if the plot continues to unfold at a quick pace, it can hinder how focused you are on what's happening. It's this potential issue that makes the large open level of downtown Seattle so brilliantly placed. Downtown isn't just a flexing of how fluent Naughty Dog had become developing for PS4 hardware. It was an expertly placed level that gave you time to breathe and collect your thoughts after they killed one of gaming's most beloved protagonists. You're offered a massive level, a map, and a simple goal with purpose. Get gas. The rate at which you complete this goal is completely up to you. Downtown has many buildings that can be explored. A few necessary and most not. The entire outside section has no hostility, no infected, no WLF, no scavengers, nothing. It's just the environment, ambience, Ellie and Dina, and enough content to clear your head. It's one of the few times to be thankful a city was empty as a result of mass pandemic death. Venturing into the many buildings you can find a fight. Nothing too overbearing, just runners and clickers. It's well incentivized by the amount of looting there is to do and the stories you can begin to follow via notes and left behind mementos. Downtown is also utilized as a great introduction to the differences in level design between part 1 and part 2. 
The Last of Us Part 1 still had some freedoms in your ability to explore an entire street. Part 2 still guides you to one destination, however the route in which you take to get there and approach starting combat encounters on the way is infinite. The downtime in this section of Seattle Day 1 was used as a mourning period for both Ellie and the player. The slow nature of it, the unwinding of the death, and the little things about Joel's personality shared between Ellie and Dina. These elements really ease you past the death and begin to get you into the mindset of what's going to soon have to happen. Joel's death is just the beginning of a story that only gets darker. Easing you into what can't be stopped is the most important thing that happens in downtown Seattle. The record store is the moment where you are made ready. The symbolic nature of the guitar in part 2 leads the way. Ellie finding a guitar in the store and proceeding to play a sampling of Future Days feels like the moment where she fully settles into her harsh reality. Joel isn't coming back, but he exists in the tools he left her, the most instrumental being their connection through music. As soon as Ellie finished playing Take On Me and set down the guitar to keep moving, it felt like that chapter of the story and our given time to mourn was over. Both the player and Ellie were done feeling so unfocused. There was only one goal in sight, and it had to be done.